Okay, it seems that it's about the time. So while we're waiting for um uh, student and uh, faculty coming, uh, so that uh is uh before we start the seminar, it's and is there any uh, announcement or news you want to share? Oh, so are, are you talking to me or? Oh, no, I'm, I'm talking to my audience. Yes. Okay. So usually before the seminar, like if there are any news or announcement, they were going to just share um, this our group. Yeah. So uh, if no, um, um, let me introduce about our guest speaker today. So um, um, Dr. Yan Da is a, an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science of the Ludi School of Informatics, Computing, and Engineering at Indiana University, Bloomington. I, uh, and he received his uh, PhD degree in computer science from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology in 2014. And he received his uh, bachelor degree in computer science from Fudan University in Shanghai in 2009. Um, he is a DOE Early Career Research Program also uh, uh, known as the ECRP awardee in 2023 and the sole winner of the Hong Kong 2015 Young Scientist Award in the Physical Mathematical Science. Um, his um, research interest included parallel and distributed system for big data analytics, data man management, data mining, and machine learning. Uh, so he's going to introduce a guide to data science and AI research, and uh, is particular in the question why and how to collaborate with uh, CS people. So um, I join to welcome Dr. Yan to give this presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zhongliang, for the introduction. And uh, I'm excited to uh, see everyone and uh, virtually, of course, right? So, and uh, uh, deliver talk. Um, so uh, uh, my talk will not be too technical and just for like uh, providing some insight on what data science and AI can do. And uh, if like, say you guys want to collaborate with me or with uh, like say other computer science people, uh, especially in data science and AI, what you can do and uh, what you need to pay attention. So first about my research, I actually do three kinds of uh, areas in core computer science uh, research, right? The first is algorithm design, where we, for example, lower the time complexity, space complexity, or we do some very effective pruning rules to uh, reach the target we want to search for uh, in much, much shorter time. Uh, the second direction is systems where we consider, uh, let's say, power line distributed computing, uh, how to use a supercomputer or use a cloud environment or use a distributed cluster that is on-premise uh, to complete a task, which let's say previously compute for several days. Now, can we finish in five minutes? Right, And then the last one uh, is machine learning, which is a really, I think the most relevant uh, area uh, to this audience. And uh, yeah, I don't know why I have an X there, but it should not be there. Okay, so how to improve the prediction and forecasting performance for data-driven models. Okay, so talking about data science and data science, uh, what is data science, right? So the basically in computer science, everyone will tell you, hey, I'm working in data science, right? Everything need to touch data, right? You know, the data structure, algorithms, right? Everything operates on data. And the, frankly speaking, for very old school computer science people, they were not like this, uh, 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 how I will uh, tell you, right? So, but that's the reality, okay? So it's a very narrow perspective that it works, okay? So data science is what we call shallow learning. Shallow learning is a term also invented by some other people. It should be just a regular machine learning, what I would say. It's not deep learning model, right? But I, I, I do adopt the shallow learning, which some other machine learning people may feel not very professional, right? So some people don't like this term, but uh, I think it's a very easy term to differentiate from deep learning, right? So, and now if you look at the breakthroughs in AI, whether it's ChatGPT or Sora, right? So these are all AI models, right? So the AI has an even broader area than machine learning, but now it's also become super narrow related to like artificial neural networks and deep learning. So you can have this approximately equal. The reality is it should be much broader, but but unfortunately in reality, 99% maybe are in these areas, right? So the other is the 
one percent because uh, the, let's say the deep learning and the the regular shell learning has been so popular and so effective, right? So it's squeezed the space of other AI disciplines. Okay, and uh, another thing I forgot to mention is if you talk about data science, there are three dimensions, right? The first is domain. Okay, it's really uh, we are talking about computer science plus X, right? X can be any domain, right? Medicine, health, right? And it can be transportation. It can be like a uh, geoscience or whatever, right? So, but in any way, you need to have a domain, right? It's applied research, okay? Uh, we need to solve the problem, but we need to two skills, right? One is computer science. The other is mathematics statistics, okay? So uh, using computer science and mathematics statistics to solve some domain-specific problem, right? So this really need the involvement of domain scientists together with uh, computer scientists, for example, to work together. And uh, yeah, so here I will differentiate uh, two kinds of machine learning. One is called shallow learning, which again, it's just regular machine learning, right? So some people call it shallow learning, other people hate it, but it's it's a good term to differentiate from deep learning. Right? So I just call them shallow learning. And probably many of you have used these tools, right? So like uh, uh, you can use uh, uh, pandas to load your health uh, EHR record and then do some data cleansing, right? So, and then you probably throw to second learn uh, read some machine learning models, and finally you use a PyPlot, Matplotlib to plot your performance diagram or like, a, uh, you know, different kind of analysis, okay? Right, and then we also have the second category, right? So called deep learning. Deep learning is uh, dedicated to artificial neural network. And the, recently the most popular uh, framework is PyTorch, right? So. Uh, they are two winners, PyTorch and TensorFlow, right? The other framework like MXNet, they, they are moving too slow and uh, people are not integrating new models there. Right? So uh, PyTorch is a safe start, but if you want to do, go to the product environment, you should switch to TensorFlow because execution-wise, deployment is more efficient. Uh, TensorFlow 2.0 has integrated Keras API, so basically they are the same thing now. Okay? And the TensorFlow is by Google and the PyTorch by Meta, right, Facebook. Okay, so, so they're competing in some sense, but Facebook now wins a little bit because of the usability. Okay, all right, so what is shallow learning, right? So uh, I bet you all see this kind of uh, EHR record, right? And uh, you have the patient information for different attributes, right? Age, gender, or like uh, some disease history, or maybe some blood pressure. Or... So these are organized as a table of columns. And you can have missing data though. Okay. So we call this tabular data, or we can call it a structured data, right? With a, a, a lot of relational tables. Okay. And we can also call it X. X is a variable, right? So it's like the input data, right? In machine learning or statistics. Y is the output data, right? So predicted from the input X. Okay. So each row in the shallow learning, so the shallow learning is really a table of rows, right? So we can call it a row, we can call it a record. If you are in the relational database, we call it a tuple. Uh, in uh, deep learning or machine learning, we call it embedding, right? And you can also call it a vector. It's the same thing, just a, a row of values. Uh, if it's not a numerical value, sometimes it's categorical, it's string, you can you can kind of use some uh, encodings, right? One hot encoding, or you can do some ordinal encoding, whatever, uh, which you're supporting, I think, in Pandas library for pre-processing, encoding to a, a row of numerical values. And then the next step after you do some data cleansing, if you need to do some dimension reduction, you can you can do PCA, right? And then you throw to some machine learning models, right? So uh, including PCA or some other uh, data cleansing augmentation uh, tools, they are all in this second learn SK learn uh, package of Python. Okay, so you can have this, uh, for example, tree based models like this injury random forest, which is using bagging, right? XG boost using boosting for the decision tree. So you can also have the second category like support back to machines. And which actually before deep learning, uh, among these shallow learning models, this works the best, right? Neural network is actually motivating deep learning, but by that time it's very shallow, so it's not working well. Okay, and then you have a uh, Bayesian inference, which is actually more popular before uh, deep learning because SVM is just like that, right? So you don't have too much room to improve. It's 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 very effective, but it's. It's just like that, right? So there's so many things you can improve. But Bayesian reference is different, right? So you can encode this uh, knowledge into a uh conditional edge, right? And then you, you kind of have a causal network created and then you can do the public reasoning on top of that, right? So you can customize it to different domains and they generate different kind of 
models, right? Like a hidden Markov model or some, some other things. Okay. And uh, so, yeah. Uh, so here's the example, right? So you can, you can input your health uh, data right into a decision tree here. And then you see whether it's a class A, class B. I'm, I'm not sure I just get it from the uh, internet, right? So maybe it's kind of different kind of a uh, particular disease or something like that, okay? Right. So based on H EHR record. All right, so for shallow learning, it's actually very mature. For example, this is called a second learn algorithm cheat sheet, which means if your data comes in, you will go through this decision tree. See, for example, the first note is, do you have more than 50 samples, right? It's last you get more data. You don't even try machine learning because it's not gonna be effective. If that is the case, then you go to the next one, then the next one, look at each node to decide where you should go and do what task, okay? So this, and the second one has maybe hundreds of models already integrated and you, you can just call them to use them. Right, so, and uh, so the typical task is classification, regression, right? So you, you want to predict how severe a like a disease, like the cancer, a, in which stage you are, for example, if you, uh, for some patients, right? And you can also do classification, uh, which category of a tumor it is or whatever, right? So, uh, so these are for the shallow learning task, okay? And uh, so, uh, unfortunately, for second learn, right? So a lot of people are very uh, happy to learn those things. It's a uh, very amazing, but for computer science uh, people, right? So this is, let's say for PhD student here, uh, this is a little bit of no, because, you know, we need to know these, these are very efficient for you to do a data analytics, but we, uh, for example, for PhD students, they need to publish papers, right? Like also like me, we need to publish. And uh, then the reviewers these days look at, for example, what is the problem meaningful and do you have technical novelty, right? So if you just call like a learn libraries, which has been implemented there, so there's low novelty, right? And then I reject, right? So in the paper review, but, uh, so it's very difficult to publish in CS, okay? But maybe let's say some data science students, uh, especially master students, not PhD students, right? They, they are interesting in early stage in the research, and to publish in some domain journals, let's say in health or in, in cancer research or whatever research uh, that in specific domain or transportation research, they can be a very good source for helping because they are learning those data science uh, techniques, right? Including maybe second learn and uh, pandas and those libraries, right? And uh, then what you need to provide is, hey, here's my data, right? So these are domain data, I have, right? I have a CT image or I have these health records, whatever, right? So these are the insights I want. I, I want to analyze these, these results, the right, outcomes. Okay. So then, then they will see, hey, based on the models they are familiar with, they learned during their master courses, what can they right, do in second learn and help you assemble your solution? Uh, and the, another thing you need to pay attention is uh, usually for some regular attributes uh, like gender, age, or whatever, uh, you can treat it like a, a attribute for the same tree or whatever, right? But if you have spatial temporal attributes, you should treat them with special care, right? If you just treat them as regular attributes, it's not going to be very effective in the models, right? For example, if you have a column that is at, at a time, right, then you have uh, some patient ID, then in different time you are measuring it's like SPO2 or, you know, it's uh, like uh, some other uh, waveform values, right? So then what you can, uh, you, you can track them, right? So you can write it like a time series data, right? And then you can do some time series modeling, machine learning models like a RIMAR, right? and then you can forecast, right? So what you see on the vertical dashed line, on the left is the historical data you fit, right? Once you fit, then in the future you can, you can predict, right? And oftentimes there's some confidence interval, right? So your that's the mean you, you think it is, but you may have one stand deviation, two stand deviation, three stand deviation, all right. So they, they can be within this range for forecasting. Okay, if there's uncertainty associated with it, right? Like, gosh, uh, there, yes, there are a lot of models like, like those. Okay. All right, so yeah, so far it's shallow learning. I think it's probably already very useful in a lot of the projects. And that's why the whole data science field is up there, right? Because of the maturity of all those Python libraries, right? So it's uh, developing, I think in the past, uh, maybe uh, 20 decades, right? So in the, then in the last decade, I think it's so mature, it can already benefit a lot of the areas.
Then what's really exciting in the recent decade is deep learning, right? So, and, and the deep, yeah, as I said, deep learning is a branch of machine learning and machine learning is a branch of AI. But unfortunately now it's like, I already talked about AI, it's deep learning models, new artificial neural network, okay? So what exactly is artificial neural network? Or what is deep learning doing? And how do you have a correct perspective of treating deep learning, right? If you treat it as science, you are in huge trouble, I would say, right? So uh, usually you treat it as a black box, but you need to know these black box, what they're good at, and you, you should be able to assemble them for different purposes. Where you should use which uh, tool, okay, right? So once you assemble them together, uh, you can accomplish your task, right? And the, again, in health, we need uh, explainability, trustworthy, all those things. But that's usually what we call the post hoc explainability analysis. Okay, so you, you let the model run and then you try to print out something to see if it makes sense or not for this prediction or something, right? So, so uh, if we, we right, let's forget about trustworthy and, uh, you know, causality, reasoning, all those things. But now let's first get things done, right? Because you cannot stop what deep learning model is doing, okay? After doing it, you can, you can see if it makes sense or not, okay? There's a branch of research on that. So, First, you need to get the job done. Right? So for example, we have an image coming in and you predict what is in the image, right? Whether it's a car or it's a truck, right? Like in this example, it should be a car. Okay. So this is composed of two components. One is those uh, cube, cubes, right? It's actually called tensors. This is using what we call the convolution neural network. Okay, so which you don't need, even need to know what it that is, because we are just building a high level perspective deep learning. Okay, so uh, the second part is what we call the shallow learning component, right? You have a few dense connecting layer and finally you have a prediction pad you go to the loss function. Okay, let's go into the details a little bit. So unlike uh, the shallow learning, right? You usually give a table, okay? Now, these table rows are not there. For deep learning, your input is more versatile. It can be an image, it can be a natural language, it can be a speech, right? And it can be a video. Right, these things you cannot say, hey, this, extract the age or something from it, right? So you may be able to detect people and then give it age estimate. I know there's apps doing that a long time ago, which go pretty popular, right? So, but, but to you, to a machine learning model, to a computer, it's just a bunch of pixels, right? Okay, so your task is actually extracting for this entire image, extracting a meaningful role of features for the image, right? That's what deep learning is doing. That's uh, what we call the representation learning, right? The first stage uh, through these cubes, right? These uh, convolutions, okay? All the way down to a vector, okay? And of course, the last cube to vector, there's some techniques like a global average pooling or flattening, but again, I don't want to go to too much detail there, okay? So then once you have this feature vector, then you just, you, you, can, you can add a SVM or whatever decision tree, but you know, we need a back propagation. And you, so usually we, we will do this MLP, okay, multi-level perception. One layer, two layers, three layers, that's layers, whatever. Okay, usually you don't go too many layers. Three layers is silly. Okay. And finally, you go to, for example, this problem, the classification problem for the image, right? So you have the class, how many classes you have, how many uh, outputs you have, right? So these output actually you do a soft max. You was, uh, again, you don't need to go to the details. Basically, it's a probability distribution of the classes, right? It's like a car is 10%, truck is 20%, Bicycle is 10% again, right? And then you find the most likely class usually, right? It's truck, okay? Or you can take the top five, like in image and competitions, okay? Yeah, so this is the first part for representation learning. Giving a object with raw features, like say pixels, natural language speech, you extract a row, right? We call it embedding. This embedding for each picture, not like a row, right? If you have a thousand pictures, now become a thousand rows, become an image, database of table, right? It's a table of 1,000 rows. Now these 1,000 rows, you can do the regular artificial neural network, dense layers, okay? And then go, go through the dense layers output. So this is embedding, then you, you just add some regular, okay? So here we have X, this X now becomes a uh, raw features, okay? And through raw feature extraction, you get an edge, which is the intermediate features, like, like what your second lens input is. Okay, it becomes a row, or we say the embedding of vector, okay? And then from there, you just go to the neural networks, right? The, the shallow learning neural networks to get your white hat. Why it's called a white hat? Because it's a prediction, okay? And the whole purpose of machine learning is to make sure you configure those 
uh, convolution models or dense layers, they have parameters you need to do to make sure your Y hat is very close to your predict uh, your ground truth Y. So here's an example, right? So let's say our prediction is 70% is a car, 20% is maybe a truck, and 10% uh, right, is something else, okay? Right. And then the ground truth is telling you hey, it's a car, right? It's 100% car, it's 0% a truck or whatever, okay? Right, so you have two vectors. On the left, we call Y hat, which is a prediction. On the right hand side, we call it Y. This is called a supervised one. You need to teach the model, okay, what is the right thing, right? And then you want to close the gap between these two vectors, right? There's some difference between these two probability distributions. So we'll compute their distance called cross entropy distance. Then you minimize this distance by, by tuning that uh, previous extracting models, right? These parameters. So hopefully, they were really, you wanted the prediction to push to one zero zero, which is called a Wilhelm encoding, okay? So the, as I said, the deep learning part is really this part, right? So feature extraction from raw features, right? And the, to get a embeddings, right? representative learning. Whatever afterwards, it's just like in second learning, okay? These are in second learning. Of course, uh, in second learning, you usually, it, you just call the model, but in deep learning, you need to attach the loss functions, attach the, your layers like yourself. Okay, so you need to give the ground truth why for supervised learning, okay, right? And supervised learning is fine, right? It's a clustering or something. But if you want to supervise learning, you need to give the labels. Tell the model what is true, what is right, so the model can learn. All right, so why deep learning is so popular these days, right? So why, is, let's say previously, there may be 1,000 researchers, now why is they now grow 100 times, right? And maybe uh, 100,000 now, right? So why? So first of all, in the old school, we need to know, let's say this matrix cookbook, right? We need to do the optimization to minimize the loss function I just showed before, okay? Because we want to minimize their difference, okay? And you can go really thin, uh, like on the right-hand side, right? So you have loss function in the high level, then you can you can compute the gradient of the loss function, uh, uh, take a derivative to the parameter, and change the parameter in a way that you will reach a low loss function, okay? So in the old days, machine learning people need to know these complicated uh, derivative formulas on the left-hand side, right? You need to have a matrix cookbook by your hand, right? So a lot of people cannot do that. Then they don't want to even touch machine learning, right? So the, what's nice is, uh, for example, these days, uh, the machine learning frameworks, right? Deep learning frameworks, not machine learning. Right? Second learning will not do it for you, okay? So deep learning frameworks, like PyTorch, TensorFlow, these frameworks, they do this called audiograph, right? So these... You just say, hey, what's a forward uh, prediction network? Then compute the gradient for this forward network fit fitting function is computed automatically for you by the frameworks, right? You now don't need to worry about the mathematics, right? So you're just becoming algorithm designer. You stack the layers properly, okay? So that's why, you know, it's uh, totally eliminated the barrier for, for machine learning, okay? Especially like deep learning. So. Uh, everyone can do it basically, right? It's like CS4, okay? So uh, again, I, I don't want to enter in any details about machine uh, deep learning, right? And uh, But we just want to bring you a high level perspective of how to view deep learning in a right perspective when you want to explore by yourself or more often if you want to collaborate with uh, your CS partners, right? And you are welcome to reach out to me, by the way, right? So if you have a problem, right? So how how you, you, you kind of, we open up uh, machine learning side a little bit, right? AI side a little bit, right? So, and then talk to uh, domain scientists. The domain scientists need to open up a, a bit knowledge on the domain a little bit side, right? So then we can kind of do very good uh, matching of the techniques to the problems, okay? Right. Okay, so the so first fact about deep learning, we will talk about five facts. Okay, the first fact about deep learning is really the representation learning side, right? So it's a like, what is truly deep learning, right? This is just add an additional layer before your second learning model, where assuming the input is a row of embeddings, right? Before that, because you don't have this row of higher level semantic features, right? Like age or something, right? So uh, you need to create these high level features that have semantic meanings. But what your input often just an image or a video or a speech signals, or let's say the uh, uh, natural language words, characters, it's a string, right? Or you can be DNA, by the way, right? So if you are doing bioinformatics, okay? Uh, or protein, like seeing uh, alpha fold, okay? Right, it can be anything. So that's that's so much different from what you 
if you know scikit-learn, right? So, or you just uh, cope with small data patient record, right? Which you just uh, do a logistic regression, maybe with some regularization, right? L1, L2 regular, a rich, uh, less rich or less than that, right? So when you have big data, you really want to go to deep learning, okay, right? So, uh, uh, so here, this diagram on the left is what we, I showed you before. So you have the raw pixels, you have any raw feature of X, right? And then you want to extract something intermediate with semantic features, right? Semantic meanings. That's like something you, you could treat as a row of data into scikit learn, right? So here, these models, these neural networks are what you, you need to know, right? These are what you assemble, okay? And uh, interestingly, for example, if you, uh, I'm not sure if you know about it, but the before deep learning, right? Well, the, the terminology that is really hard is data mining. For example, the KDD conference on the right is a, a number one, the best data mining conference. Unfortunately, then in the last decade, deep learning becomes so hard, right? So previously, ICML, NIPS is very machine learning. Now there's a new conference called I, I Clear, right? ICLR, where LR is representation learning. Is that an extracted edge embedding from your raw data features? Okay. So I, I clear now pop up, it's less than 10 years for sure, but it becomes a uh, more prestigious conference by CS rankings than KDD. By, by default, we go to CS rankings, which ranks CS departments for, for how many tier one publications they have, right? So KDD is uh, by default not ticked, okay? And I clear is ticked for ranking, okay? So you can see uh, the in impact of deep learning these days, okay? All right, so... Uh, Next few slides, I just want to show you, again, there are different kinds of networks for different kinds of input features, input data, raw features, okay? Right, but they are all representation learning. Okay, let's take a look at the second feature, right? So it's transformer models. This is a particular model called BERT, right? So which Google invents. So your input is not a sentence. Let's say I am hungry, uh, then I eat a lot as a result, right? So you, you have these two segments of sentence thing. And these are embedded into word embedding. There's a tokenizer actually, right? Which also can be learned. Okay. And once you embed it, throw into this transformer blocks, which transformer is actually uh, replacing this kind of uh, convolution or RN these days, right? Becomes a state of the art now for really large foundational models. Okay. And then you, you go through a few layers, right? So the CRS is for the entire sentence. Okay. And uh, then each one emit also for that particular word you, you have embedded, okay? In the last layer, let's say we really want to do some prediction for the entire sentence, then you get a CRS corresponding embedding, H, right? So this H is that vector that encodes the entire sentence meaning, okay? On top of that, you can do a few fully connect layers, just like a shallow learning neural network, and you do your prediction, right? And then you add a loss function to your prediction and your ground choose whether that's close or not, okay? So you still have X, for this sentence as input to transformer, right, to, to the bird, and the output is a, a encoding and embedding, maybe 100 dimensions, 300 dimensions for the entire sentence, okay, which you can use for machine learning. Right, so here's the example of the internals of what a bird is, right? So you, you have these tokens down T1, T2, T3 in, which is a raw input, right? Of course, you need to embed them, you uh, use tokenizer to H1, this intermediate in, encoding for these tokens, right? Then if you go through another layer called self-attention, which I don't want to talk too much about it, but then you have for these three tokens, three words, you have another uh, contextualized uh, uh, embedding, H2, right, for each word. And then you go to MLP, this finished one transformer layer. Then you have, the, you emit three new embeddings, right, more contextualized embeddings for these three words. And then you, because deep learning means you can encode, 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 and the performance actually will improve, right, and then, then predict. Okay, so then, Actually, you, you can have those things, right? But in, anyway, you can see your input is a word, the output is a, a, a embedding, a vector. Right? So here is a illustrative purpose, we have a vector for values, okay? In reality, you can have a token of less one, uh, 512, right? The, the, the vector can also be very long. Okay, I, I forgot the size. Okay. All right, so uh, another example is you can do recurrent neural network, which has been replaced by transformer models these days, right? So, but, but let's look at what a uh, recurrent neural network can do, RNN, okay? Like LSTM, GRU, a special kind of RNs, okay? So what it can do is again, right? So you have these recurrent modules that takes, let's say H1 is encoding the historical information, X1, okay? 
And then you pass through a layer from X1 historical sequence information and your new input X2, you encode into a new representation for the whole sequence so far, right? If you see a new input X3, you can input X, X2, which encodes all the information from X1, X2, right? And then attach the new input X3, then generate through this neural network, generate a internal in, uh, representation H3 for the sequence so far, like X1, X2, X3, right? This can do time series prediction or those kind of thing, right? Uh, each time you can emit an output, let's say, oh, is a patient in, is it surgery, right? The, the, is the blood pleasure not right, or right? the SpO2 is too low or whatever, right? So uh, is, is the patient gonna have some issues, right? So you can predict at, at every time to die, okay? And then you also have the ground truth, right? Doctor will see it, right? If you have enough waveforms collected, you can say, hey, something gonna go wrong, let's say three steps later, right? Let's say each step is one minute, then three minutes later, something is gonna go wrong. You should do something during the surgery. Okay, right. So, so RN is an example where you can go really wild, right? So if you just learn, like learn or like very traditional machine learning uh, causes, right? You, you, all you can do is uh, analyze the table, right? But when you have RN, it unleashes all the opportunities for you, right? It shows how you can smartly combine those machine learning techniques. Okay, so for example, this is a one-to-one, -one, right? This X, as we said, this is the lower level is the input X, right? I mean, intermediate level is the embeddings X. Output is y, okay, which you you have a loss function prediction one. So you, this is actually the naive dense layer, right? So it's an input and have a dense layer and the output. But you can also have this, right? We, we call it image caption. So what it means is that let's say we just talked about you can use convolution net to encode an image to a a vector, right? And assume this pre-trend it's looking at so many images, it's really encoding the meaningful information. Then you want to image a description of the image, right? So what you can do is you can you, you can throw as a input to LSTN, then you kind of emit the words, right? This words can be auto regressively filled back to, to the, as a context, right? And then you can predict the next word, okay? So it's like giraffe standing all the way, if you see an end token, then the caption image. Okay, so this is like, you have an image information encoded in this embedding here, uh, in the very first step, and then you, you, you emit, you know, the output in, in every step. Okay, so this, so you can have this what we call one to many. Then you also can have this many to one, right? Let's say you have let's say the movie sucks or whatever, right? So you need to say, hey, this uh, nine percent is uh, good, right? No, ninety one percent is terrible. Okay, right? So uh, so you can have a sentence, and if only if you finish all the sentence, right? These words are what come, comes one after another. But only when you finish all the sentence, this last green embedded vector, right, capture the whole sentence. Then you you do the prediction on top of it. Using let's say a dense layer, right? So this this is another example sentiment analysis, right? So and you can also do many to many. Uh, let's say if you have machine translation, right? So you first want to emit a English term, uh, sentence, right? How are you, right? So and this embedding. So the, 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 this uh, embedding in the middle uh, will actually encode the, the the how are you the entire sentence information. Then just like an image captioning, right? You can image the, the translation. If you, you, you try it enough, right, with English, French, English, French, then you will be able to uh, get the French words out finally, right? So like, comme allez-vous, right? So it's, how are you in French, okay? Yeah. All right, so, and uh, uh, you can also do many-to-many, -many, right? So it, this is for video analysis, right? So if you have a video and then, you know, each time you need to say, hey, whether there's some person in there, or you may want to predict the action of the person in each step, right? So you can have the video coming in, and again, video is 2D, right? Uh, RGB, okay, 3D actually, tensor. You need to encode by CN into vector, then you can emit in LSTM. So of course, this is a very, very old school technique, right? Now we have this comp LSTM that, that can directly take a tensor, okay? So, but anyway, you can see, all we want to say is you have the raw input X, right? And then you can kind of encode into this uh, CN, right? So, so for the one time stamp, and then you encode us through the sequence to, to the current sequence embedding. That's the latest time stamp for the current video series, right? The embedding. Everything becomes a vector. And from that vector, you can predict something, okay? That's, if you use the LSTM, it will consider the historical information. 
So another thing is why is Airstream works, right? So don't worry about it. Okay, just the testing works. Okay, so there are people really uncomfortable with the machine learning, especially deep learning, because deep learning is kind of like if you are doing Bayesian inference, right? So you you need to decide, hey, which neuron connect to which neuron, which variable connect to which variable. But you think about what is deep learning doing. Right? So I, I put a dense layer, and the links are what you, by data driven, we, we, we learn the weights, right? And these neurons, so the link weight is really close to zero. That means the link can actually is not important. There are no correlation between these variables, right? But it's totally by data to learn these weights, okay? You kind of give up any knowledge encoding, okay? But it works when you have large data. It won't work if you are having a small data, let's say, for drug testing, you only have 30, 50 people, right? But just to use a uh, logistic regression. All right, so uh, we are still at factor one, right? I, I need to speed up a little bit. Another example is what if you have this kind of graph structured data, right? So for example, the nodes can be some features of your protein, right? So it can be even just sequence of protein, right? So then you, you can encode it using this kind of protein birth into an embedding. Okay, so anyway, there's some input features for each node, right? And then there's also links, right? It can be a, let's say, uh, even this thing can encode a, uh, let's say a chemical, right? Or it can just be protein-protein interaction network, okay? Right, so if it's a graph structured data, then what you can do is you can still using this, what we call the graph GC or graph convolution layer, okay? And then you basically, each node kind of mix its features with the neighborhood, it's in direct neighbors. And you do it multiple times, you can propagate to maybe two hop neighbor and three hop neighbor to encode that information to you. And finally, so you can see after three layers, we get the embedding for each node in H3, right? And then we can do a fully connected layer to predict our result. Like the fully connected layer is like shallow land. Okay, so, so we can go from the blue features now to the green features for each node, looking at the context. Again, why, why these uh, convolution layers will, will extract meaningful features? It's by the last function, right? You, you, let us, you teach it why, why hat should be close to y. So it will tune these layers to make some good. Uh, another, now we move to the second deep learning fact, okay? Right, so you see that all these deep learning stuff are so fancy, right? So are they really special? The answer is really not, right? So everything is classification regression, okay? But the computer people are finding very elegant way, a smart way of organizing the classification regression. And so they can do things that you, you don't immediately see as a classification regression, right? And these days for genetic models like ChatGPT, or uh, for like a diffusion models for generated images, right? So you really need a also sampling. Okay, we will see that shortly, okay? But just give you a very high level idea. So for example, you have an image coming in like a cat, you need to bond, uh, using bounding box to say where the cat is, right? Okay, here you can say where the corner of the cat is, y, and let's say what's the box size, with the height, okay? So after you code the convolution, uh, using convolution network, encode it to a vector, right? This vector, can have two hats. One has for predicting the x, y, and with a height, okay, or regression, because these are the what's coordinates, these are the actual value, numerical values, okay. Uh, for value prediction, we call it regression. The second is categorical prediction, whether it's a cat or dog or whatever in the box, right? So this we, we can then uh, add another loss as for classification, right? So if you want to know the details, it's L2 loss for regression. Uh, to get a box coordinates, and then also in the box, whether it's a cat or dog, you, you get the red label, okay? So again, uh, this is for natural image. In, let's say, CT image, you can you can find where the tumor is and what kind of tumor it is, right? Okay, and uh, so again, here so far, you see we can only detect one object in the image, right, the major object. Then uh, we will see how you can detect many objects later, but it's still classification and regression. Okay? So the second uh, example is this work called a pose estimation, right? You want to find the people, and then for each people, you want to find the, the joints or eye or the key uh, structure of the human being, right? And it's just no magic again, right? So you kind of uh, have this image out and then, uh, because you only have, let's say 20 joints, right? You just uh, uh, predict the locations. Here, you can also give a classification of who they are their actions, right? That's a class class. Okay, what the action this guy is doing. Frankly speaking, this should be a video stream, right? So you should uh, like LSTM, you should consider historical data. Okay. All right. So now this again, you need to dig out those objects, then 
for each dig it out object to do the regression, right? whether it's a bounding box or the joints. So how to dig it out? Right? So again, there's no magic. You have these what we call anchor box for each location. You try different boxes and you try to, hopefully one box will, will really bounding some object, right? If it says no object, you will predict as background, okay? If there's an object, you will predict, hey, that's, that's, that's a that's a ship or whatever, okay? Right, and then you, you detect things also have a confidence level. Remember, it's a probability vector. If the probability is high enough, then you emit that detection, okay? So everything is still classification and regression, right? Okay, so here's the example you can see, right? So now you can even do pixel-wise, if you know hey, there's a void, in this bounding box, right? Then you can you can actually do pixel-wise classification. Say, hey, whether this pixel is a boy or this pixel is not a boy, let's say uh, grass or some other boys, right? So you can you can get the yellow thing out, right? It's like pixel-wise classification. We call it segmentation. But it's again pixel-wise classification. So everything is classification and regression in deep learning. Okay. And the plus generation, if you want to have generative models, right? So here an example. Well, we do character level generation. Character level generation is much easier because you only have so many characters, right? It's so a word level, then you have more, more space uh, input that you need to distribute your probability on, okay? So here's an example where you want to say hello, right, the vocabulary. If your model trained well, if you get an edge, it will emit E and it will, it will generate some meaningful sentence, okay? So this is because, you know, it sees enough text, right? And the word generates its natural language. But they may not satisfy your goal. Let's say you are doing question answering, right? That's why OpenAI say we need this alignment, right? So because you just your training is for natural languages, but it may not be meaningful language to your question, right? So there's a, a human reinforcement learning with human feedback, right? So so that it, 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 they are hitting your point, hopefully. Okay. Right. So here's an example of the you know. NLP, where you, you can dig out words. Here you can, for each word, how likely it's part of the bag of term, right? It's a medical term detection, just like the bounding box. Once you have those things, you can classify them, right? Here we are using QIS, which is a concept you identify from UMLS, which is a terminology for medical terms defined by NIH, okay? And from there, once you dig out those terms, hopefully they can help you do a better job on uh, large language response, right? For example, you can use these concepts and do so-called uh, uh, augmented uh, uh, REG, right? Uh, 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 I forgot the term. Anyways, you can augment some additional context in there and then generate the answer, okay? And uh, so, uh, yeah, so still uh, the fact two about deep learning, right? So. Uh, you can see, right, although it's a classification, regression, the sampling, okay, actually, if you do large language models, the sampling, you have a temperature parameter to set, right? If your, your temperature parameter is set uh, to, to be too conservative, it will always produce most likely words next time. But if you want a diversity, then uh, you will flatten out, and hopefully it's become more uniform distribution, okay? And uh, so, uh, yeah, so in any way, because of raw feature extraction, Plus the readout usages, right? Different kind of combination of bounding box or term or those things, right? So it could, now it can do diverse tasks, like look pretty crazy for you guys, okay? Right. So besides classification regression, we can do forecasting for the future. We can do object detection, image segmentation. Right? We can do anti regression from the tags. We can do structure generation for drug discovery, for example, right? Of course, you need to check whether that is meaningful or not, right? or do some experiments on that later. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so unfortunately, deep learning is a black box. Okay, the first uh, step in order to enter into deep learning is give up the explanation, okay? The second step is the one the deep learning model train. Then you try to explain it like using some, like a uh, activation map or gradient or using some other technique, right? But, but the deep learning model just trains because, you know, it's just a, a great descent, right? There's no meaning for it, right? So you just want to minimize your error, okay? And you don't question any about those why dense layer works or those things, right? It's just works, right? That's, it, it, it's just no science, but it's engineering and it works. That's why so many big companies invest so much money there, okay? Right, and again, you need a big data. So in the old days, deep learning, like a shallow neural network is terrible, right? It basically triggers the AI winter where deep learning people cannot find any Bonds actually, right? So 
but then there's an image that by Fefeli from Stanford, they, they curate a lot, a lot of data. And then NVIDIA has this uh, GPGPU uh, ready, then we can process more data. And then people find that your regular, like logistic regression, those models really have a ceiling of the performance. But if you continue to fill the data, the deep learning models performance start to surpass the shallow learning models. Right, and then it will even go way, way, way beyond, right? You are, you are asking, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, Gayatri. Yeah, and then the deep learning model performance accuracy can go really shoot to 90%, right? So that's why it's so amazing, right? So you cannot afford uh, to use a model that is uh, only 30% accuracy, right? You, if it's now 95%, maybe you can use it most of the time, okay? All right, so just again, treat it as a black box, but there's some design principles, right? So how do you, what, what kind of neural network can track what kind of features, right? This is based on your data, right? So you need to have your domain data. So what kind of data I have, what are the key characteristics of the data, what are the fields, right? Then you design your model, okay? And then what's my task? What I want to predict, right? What's important in this problem? What are the restrictions, constraints, right? These are the loss function design. So we have two parts. And so for the models, we have uh, like transformer diffusion model and a multi-module learning, which you need a feature fusion, okay, right? So a lot of things you can play with. And uh, so uh, for loss functions, there's also a bunch of loss functions. If you do ranking, you may want to use a triplet loss, right? A contrastive loss. If you are doing just a regular classification, maybe uh, you can use a uh, focal loss, of course, entropy loss, right? If you are doing regression, maybe the uh, Huber loss, or just the MSE mean square error. Okay. And then, so why is there so many deep learning works these days, right? It's like uh, crazy, it's unreasonably many, right? Because first of all, uh, you, you have a data, right? Then you have a task. Then you see how deep learning can play with it, right? From the data, new data, you generate new model. From new task, you generate new loss function and piece them together. You get a new paper, okay? Right, so you're happy you present some paper, okay? As a PhD student. And, uh, Again, this field has become so crowded, but that's not all, right? So there are other aspects. Let's say if you want to pri protect privacy, you cannot uh, have the centralized data. The data should keep in, let's say, each hospital, right? You, different departments don't want to share data with each other. But we want to train the model together so you can, it gradient, you can share, right? But the raw data you cannot share. That's great, uh, federal learning, right? And you can also do the policy making, right? So you, we, where we should really do the action, right? So that's reinforced learning. You, you have action and reward is canceled. You can also speed up the computation because now we have so many large data, right? Yeah, accelerators. And uh, so the fourth factor is the use foundation models, right? So uh, I think the recent five years, the difference is that we have this BERT, we have this uh, chat GPT, GPT-4, and we have this Sora. And uh, so what's happening there, right? These big IT companies have numerous data from the internet. Some are actually, uh, my guess is proprietary data, right? They have some way to get all the data there. Okay, so that's, that's why New York Times is suing OpenAI, okay? Right, but anyway, so you have so many data, you see so many data by these big companies that can train, like spend $1 million to train a model, right? So this model encodes so much information over the web. So you don't want to train all your 1,000 samples only, right? You want to use the foundation model and fine tune it so that the, it works better on your own model, but it can still benefit from the so numerous, numerous data it sees from the internet, okay? So for learning these foundation models, which is uh, of concern for these big companies, not of you, right? So how do they train? They look at the sentence and dig out a word, and then look at surrounding word, predict what's the word in the middle, right? So you, this is called a self-supervised learning because you don't want people to label them, right? You just get all the text in Wikipedia and then take, take out a word and then guess, right? You have the label, but the label is created directly from the raw data. Right, and Camille Hua has a, a, a proposed this MAE, right, master autoencoder, extend this idea into images, right? So you can kick out some patches and hopefully can recover the patch, okay? Once you see enough images, hopefully you can, for each image you have very good features. And this recently has been extended to satellite images, right? Because NASA has scanning so much satellite images. Why not just also do the same thing, right? And there's temporal dimension also, it's around 3D. There's a temporal dimension there, okay? And then as a users, we should uh, start from a foundation model and then we fine tune it. Let's say starting from BERT, we have some biomedical literature, right? But it has no comparison with uh, so many internet data 
beyond the uh, biomedical concept, right? And but there are some terms that are still helpful for our biomedical domain, right? So then you can create a bio bird by fine tuning the bird on medical data, like Purple Map. After that, if you are just an interesting health electronic health record and not other biological stuff, then you can fine tune that bio data on let's say the hospital records. Okay. And finally, then you can do what you, you care about in your specific task for your PI. Okay, so uh, the last fact is that uh, the best timing to enter in AI has passed, right? So 2016 is where AI really getting hot. 2018, 2018 is uh, from my perspective, if you want to get on the trend of AI to be an AI researcher, that's the last year, right? So which is where I enter this, okay? Now you can see the number just go crazy, right? So you can see the ML archive papers, 100 new ML papers each year, which of course in deep learning was late, right? And uh, so, uh, and uh, if you look at surrounding, previously I think AI people maybe maybe 20%, now after just five years, it grow to maybe more than 90% for sure. It's just so surprising, right? So because some conference only have 100, 200 people, but AI conference has, you know, 10,000 people, right? So it's the community grows like crazy exponentially, okay? So publication by year, you can see the curve from 2006 to 2021, the growth just like quickly, right? And the number of papers in the major conference are also great, go quickly. Like Triple AI, this is just 2020. And I've been Triple AI reviewers. I see the paper IDs are always 10,000 something, okay? And CVP also grow like crazy, right? So this uh, blue curve is the submit papers and the red curve is the... Uh, accepted papers, okay? And you can see the accelerated dropping, <laughs> right? It's getting difficult. And also AI researchers are getting crazy citations, right? So of course, early on AI researchers like Kami He, uh, who invented the ResNet, which uh, he proposed the ResNet in 2016, but has been cited for 21, uh, uh, 215 thousand times, more than 215 thousand times, okay? That's crazy, right? So it's just a, a few years, right? Less than 10 years. You got so many citations. Okay. And like uh, uh, Jeffrey Hinton, right, with one of the Turing Award winners for deep learning, right? So it's, you see the total citation is uh, 789, right? So that's also, so you can see this, how this field is growing. So, and the growing, the field is growing so far. So it's really difficult for domain science to re really track up, right? So, of course, you can look up your narrow domain, but you, you still need to learn those things, right? And uh, AI papers and the people are exploding exponentially. And uh, of course, you need to know some groundbreaking works, right? But many works may not have value. So you also need to judge, let's say, among these uh, 2,000 to 3,000 NIPS paper or CVPR papers, which maybe these 20 papers are, I really want to read. It's relevant to my research and it's high quality, right? So why so many people? First, you don't need mathematics to do deep, deep learning anymore. It's become just a stack in the layers. And like it's a it's a playing uh, the Lego toys, right? So secondly, you have large data set everywhere, right? Like image data, the first one. Then you have Microsoft Coco, like you have uh, not not numerous data there, right? So like the satellite data I mentioned, right? Kaggle only on Kaggle they share. So data is no longer a problem. You have big data, okay? In the macro domains, though, it's a little bit different. So you need to be cautious, right? So some of the patient number is just eighty or something. Then you need to uh, be a little bit cautious about whether you want to use deep learning or not. If there's not raw features, usually shallow learning models will work better than deep learning, okay? And then also NVIDIA has this uh, uh, A100, right? Previously P100, V100, then get A100, H100, and then recently got a V200, right? So it's becoming just crazy, uh, you know, strong deep computing power, okay? So yeah, so why we want to collaborate with computer science people, right? So first of all, you don't have time to learn so many Python libraries, right? There's a lot of things to learn. Even second-learn PyTorch, maybe uh, second-learn maybe fine, but PyTorch is a very complicated already, right? And you, uh, you also need to do the large-scale model training, fine-tuning on GPU computers. It's maybe a little bit troublesome for non-computer science people, right? And uh, you take a lot of time to learn, and uh, you may still not be proficient, right? And let's say you have computer science people code this model and train in one week, and you spend maybe three months just learning. Okay. Also, understanding the model, the latest model, right? So because the field is moving so quickly, and you uh, and how to design a new model, understanding what's the latest model, and uh, motivating your new model, right? Needed some experience, right? Even AI researcher cannot keep up with so many papers these days, right? How can uh, other domain people understand 
right? Even understanding one AI paper takes time because there are a lot of prerequisites. And the AI papers are among the most written papers. They assume you know a lot of things, right? So they don't expand the background. And for students and without this background, uh, the product can easily be just one tenth of a computer science student. And uh, uh, the relative solution could still look trivial to computer science people. If you submit to your domain journal, maybe it's fine, but submit to a computer science big conference, low novelty, low novelty, like five years ago studied, right, reject. Okay, so, and uh, the new model may perform better also, right? So, and why not just focus on your science problem, a health problem, a medicine problem? A lot of computer science people take care of the model design and coding. So to collaborate with, uh, let's say, young lab, like my lab, right? So why you want, to, you have the motivation to do that. First of all, I have a extensive experience, uh, including many awards and uh, 100 plus papers in top venues, right? And then we have world trained student in computer science and AI, right? So again, I also work on systems. If you want to speed up like a genome assembly or whatever, uh, large scale computing, right? That's also good, okay. So, but as a domain people, to motivate computer science people to work with you, you need to expand the data really well to, to the computer science people because how we design the network depends on the data, right? And you also need to uh, expand this concept in medicine, for example, right? Where we, computer science people may not know or totally forget from high school biology course, okay? And also you need to prepare computer science people for understanding what a task you are really doing and motivate them to say, this task is really meaningful, right? It's gonna have some impact in science. Or in medicine, right? So otherwise, they were gradually shifting to those more intuitive and more money paying, right? So these, these big companies, right? So they are doing robotics, doing autonomous driving. It's more intuitive. You don't need to know pretend to do autonomous driving, right? It's, oh, there's a pedestrian in the front or something, right? And the salary is much higher, right? So oftentimes, uh, 200K just for my student and graduate, if you can get a job there, right? Pass the coding review, okay? Right. And uh, why we I want to do, let's say, atmosphere simulation or why I want to do the, like a pretend 3D shaping, right? So I, you know, so you need to motivate those students to work with you, right? So you need to explain the data for model design and explain the task clearly, which also helps them design the loss function and you need to motivate them, okay? Uh, so uh, here's uh, from students that get, I don't know what's all these medical concepts becomes, oh, I have curiosity. I think that's really important right? and I want to use my technique Right, AI technique to, to medicine, to uh, health, for instance, right? And uh, so what will be needed from you, clear data description, availability, right? Oftentimes the data is uh, proprietary or cannot leave your departments and whether you need to sign some agreement to use the data without the disclosure to other places, right? And, uh, or you have some public data equivalent on Kaggle that a student can try out. And then you can try the model on your uh, department, right? So, or another thing is that you can, uh, you should have a clear objective and accounts. What what's I want to predict, right? That's we want to choose why we need to let the model know for them to learn. Yeah, uh, I think I'm going a little bit beyond the time, so thank you. Yeah, that's all I want to discuss. Well, thank you for uh, the wonderful talk, and it's very informative. So, any Good. question from our audience? I think uh, this is Jingjing. I'm faculty in the department and uh, wonderful talk, Dr. Yan. Thank you. And uh, based on your description about shallow le learning and the deep learning, obviously, like mm -hmm. we based on structured data. So mainly our learning using machine learning is shallow learning for sure. But mm -hmm. I can see the future, not future currently. There's so, so much data, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, natural language, imaging, video, mm -hmm. cam if they will be the future, I would say, yes, AI will, it's not only future currently, it's like you said, like 95% of CS people become uh, AI people. And I totally agree with you that, um, you know, for us in this department, we are uh, the domain researcher. Mm -hmm. And I can see, yes, the mutual beneficial of collaboration between domain researcher and uh, AI researcher, that's, that's, going to be um, the way to go. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you for the comments. Uh, by the way, for structural data, I think a graph neural network would be a very good uh, tool. Maybe there's other tools that if you want, you can look into. Yeah. Any other question? 
Um, I have a question. So uh, I'm thinking about the AI technique. Always I just uh, read the, the state of art article, like in domain knowledge, they also have a very marginal increase of the performance, or maybe they just adding more like overfitting problem to this model to increase the performance. So this is uh, maybe a bottleneck of the future trend. So what do you, what's your envision or your vision in, in just overcome some bar barrier of those kind of problem? Oh, okay. So uh, the, one issue I think with uh, AI papers these days is for example, you know that neural networks are randomly initialized, right? So for example, you do great descent. I think I have a slide on, on the terrain kind of thing, right? So, uh, but you actually, when you do, let, let me try to get there, sorry. Yeah, it's right here. But you don't start always from here. You can start from here, start from here, start from here, right? So uh, this is called Xavier initialization. Usually, if you define a layer, it will start from different places. And they are the, the lowest uh, you know, loss location because it's not strictly convex, right? It can be sometimes uh, in, in this uh, place and sometimes in this place and sometimes in this place, OK? so. In, with different parameters, the prediction performance actually will have some variance. So I always feel that a, a more reasonable deep learning paper should train the model multiple times, like 10 times, and report, uh, let's say, the mean accuracy plus or minus the standard deviation, right? So, but not a lot of people are doing that, right? Because, you know, they spend so much time designing the model and finally find, oh, it's not working out so well. They may, I, I don't think it's a good trend, but there are people play with around the randomness. Okay, so this is definitely wrong, right? This, or maybe also comes the p-value to really show, hey, my model statistically is winning you because there's some randomness due to the initial weight setting there. Uh, but yeah, there are papers doing that. I think this should be, be made a standard, but it's it's going to be difficult because the deep learning model are more expensive trend. And you usually want to test so many different settings. Uh, but I would encourage always try to run the same model, train the same model multiple times and see how the performance works whether then from the whole distribution of the accuracy, you see whether it beats the other model. I think the one thing, the second thing is just like what I said, with among these 2000 papers, maybe just 100 papers are really important, literally uh, pushing the frontier forward, right? Others are what we call the incremental papers and adding some maybe look looking like important, but actually it's not so working out ideas, but they still want to publish, right? So there are some people need to filter out and that also need a lot of experience. Yeah, thank you. And also uh, another question is about the uh, data, like um, if we have uh, the data there, but we don't know whether the data quality it is like after the training, maybe we just like get, get garbage in, garbage out. So do you have any like suggestion in just filter those uh, high quality data? Uh, so this is case by case. Uh, can you give an example? What kind of Trash out you are talking about, for example? Uh, like some literature, if we do like language model, like um, to just uh, get some, yeah. we have some contradict conclusion from those. Um, oh, like, yeah. Like so that. there's a post hoc processing, uh, like a causal analysis, or you can actually, what we call the model editing, if, if you use Google this word. So basically, if you find something is really wrong, you can edit the model. Hey, say we want to change the last function and really penalize this mistake a lot, hopefully the model will learn from it, right? And there's also like a knowledge distillation and data distillation. You can convert the previous training data into a synthetic, but a much smaller data set. But then you encode this uh, uh, mistake there to let it, the loss function see more of this mistake and try to fix it. So this is one possible way, right? Model editing. Another thing is that you can, uh, uh, you can do this, uh, what we call reinforced learning with human feedback. This is actually what uh, uh, you know, OpenAI is doing for their chat GPT model and GPT-4. Uh, because uh, as I just said, let me let me go to here. Uh, where, where, it's here, yeah. So you can see uh, what a uh, language model is trying to look at all the texts in the internet, right? And then pick out a word and uh, you, you know the, the word is, for example, you, for example, right? Uh, but, but but actually take it out and look at the surrounding world, try to get this word, right, using a neural network. So hopefully you, you, this neural network will be learned well, the parameters were set to be able to recognize each word, right? So, uh, but this doesn't align with your goal. Your goal, maybe you're, you're asking whether this uh, protein will be effective uh, for, for, for particular 
uh, regulation of some disease or something like that, right? So, so for that purpose, maybe, maybe it, it's it's just gonna give you natural language, but it's not hitting your core, right? So that's why OpenAI has this uh, reinforced learning with human feedback. Actually, they have some active learning problem, right? It will tell you, hey, this generation trash, right? Generating that direction, human need to involve, the human in the loop training, and then gradually will have the model improve. OpenAI, I think they have 40 annotators if you read some of their papers, just to hire full time just to do the this this work of doing human feedback and then retraining. Right? It's a hybrid of they call it a reinforced learning, but I think it's hybrid of reinforced learning, which is a PPI with them, plus active learning because they they want to, you know, human giving feedback. You cannot give feedback a million items, right? You need to find the most informative information to improve the model for the human annotator to to annotate and then retrain the model. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your insights. Um, sure. So. Thanks again. Um, that's drawing me to just uh, thanks for Dr. Yan for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. So um, I'm going to talk about that. next week. We have the three students to talk about their research. Um, at Tani, Lutana, and Xiang Zhong. So yeah, that's all for today's seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have a wonderful day. You too. Yes, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, I I I Right. Um so, so you're going to upload this high screen presentation before Thursday, like two yeah. Yeah, on the uh, start. Yeah. Uh yeah, ten uh, and after that you have a chance to revise. Honestly, sorry, I can leave. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can log out. Yeah, yeah. I think so the email. Yeah. Let me find so you, you don't have. Twelve eight.